Good morning, good morning. Welcome once again to Portland Bible Church, our church in Vancouver here. We call it our church in exile from Portland. We are Portland Bible Church, and so welcome to all of you who are here live with us in person, those who are live streaming on Facebook, and those who will get it later on YouTube. Try to get it posted today sometime so you have that uh, information there. Uh, keep in mind that we do have uh, the website, Portland Bible Church. Dot com. You can go there, top of the homepage, it has services listed there, and there's a drop-down menu, you can go down to a link for YouTube and get it there. So we have our services at um, Sunday morning, of course, right now at 10 o'clock and 11.15. Take a little break in between for some goodies that we have here that folks have brought. I'll give you a chance to take a, take a refresher for a moment, and then we come back at 11.15, and after our second service this morning, we sing the great hymns of the church right here, so if you can join us for fellowship, we certainly love to have you here, and uh, that's what we do on Sunday, and then on Thursday we have Bible study at 7 o'clock, and after our Thursday night class, we have a prayer meeting for about half an hour or however long it takes, and we pray for the needs of the saints, our local church, our friends, family, prayers and praises. If you have any praises or prayer requests, give me a call or one of the deacons, and we'll be sure to include that in our agenda. Also remember that on uh, Wednesday, Judy Glennie, my wife, has a Bible study right here for the ladies, so if you'd like to attend, uh, right now they're going through First John, so a very interesting study. We've done it in the past, and she's now developing that study for the ladies, so if you'd like to do that, uh, you're certainly welcome to come to that. We do have back in the back room here a table with books, uh, so we have available all sorts of different books by many of the great theologues of our day, theologians, and therefore... They're available to you on a grace basis, free. Just take whatever you need. Uh, we need uh, any more. We order them. So this is our grace gift to you so you can enjoy the materials. We mention them from time to time, but uh, the people that are here can go out and peruse. Uh, if you uh, know something and would like something, give us a call and we'll be sure to send it out to you free and uh, obviously <clears throat> postpaid. It's our custom to take a few moments at the beginning of each of our Bible studies for silent prayer. This gives you the opportunity to clear the deck, spiritually speaking. We understand that God does not hear our prayers uh, if we have sin in our life. Therefore, one of the main agendas before we begin to pray is to confess any sins to the Father, again, on the basis of the fact that Christ died and paid for all sins, all sins, past, present, and future, and we simply cite that and say that since God has forgiven all sins based on the work of the cross, we acknowledge our sin, and as believers, we are restored to fellowship. Uh, John tells us in his first epistle, if we as believers <clears throat> confess our sins, that is to name them, cite them, agree with God that they're sins, he, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, <clears throat> pardon me, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So not only do we have the ones that we name or cite, forgiven, of course, but those that we have forgotten or uh, didn't know about, and so they're cleansed and removed and forgiven, and then we have the enabling or the filling of the Holy Spirit, which is the means whereby we fulfill the command to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so in order to do that, we have the mechanics of what we call confession of sin, 1 John 1, 9. So in preparation for our study this morning, take a few moments then for silent prayer, and then I'll close in audible prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your gracious provision for us as believers in your Son, Jesus Christ. The fact that you've given us your word that we can understand who and what you are, your plan for us, and our destiny in the future. We thank you for all these marvelous gifts. We thank you for the salvation that your Son has provided on the cross. Our salvation, which includes forgiveness of sin and the promise uh, of everlasting life, which begins at the moment we believed in your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for these things. We pray as we study this morning that you'd edify our soul based on the passages that we have before us. We recognize that your word is alive and powerful and is energizing to our very soul. 
And therefore, we pray that that energy would be within us as we study and that it would uh, empower us to do those things that are pleasing in your sight so that when we come into your presence, we can hear those words. Well done, good and faithful servant. Now, as we study this morning, we pray that the Holy Spirit will encourage us, challenge and motivate us by the things we study. For we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. Let my cry come before thee, O Lord. Give me understanding according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is truth. Study to show yourself approved unto God, workmen that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Open this morning to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. We're in the section of the third resultant warning concerning spiritual advance, and we have seen this from chapter 5, 11. It goes all the way through 6, 8, so we're kind of in the midst of that. And we're in that rather difficult section, as we noted in the previous class, Hebrews 6, 4 through 6. It's not the only one, but it's one that is often contended in terms of people who study these and say, well, looks like we can lose our salvation. So we've spent considerable time on this passage to demonstrate that this is not what it means. There is no passage in the entire Bible anywhere that you can find that ever says any such thing as you can lose your salvation. It's just not there. We have things that describe falling from grace, uh, falling or uh, being uh, uh, drifting off course, all sorts of expressions, but these are all for believers. Another thing that you have to remember is that not only the book of Hebrews, but the bulk of the entire Bible, for that matter, is addressed to believers. There are passages, of course, that present to the unbelievers the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Acts 16, 31 comes readily to mind. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. This is for the unbeliever. But most of the Bible, Old and New Testament, and particularly the bulk of the book of Hebrews, as far as I can see, is addressed to believers. And so the question is, well, they're already believers. Can they lose salvation? So that's the other side of the coin. We have those, of course, in Christendom who take all different matters, uh, manner of positions on these. Uh, either they would suggest that if you do not demonstrate uh, excellent behavior as they would determine it, then you probably are unsaved or um, uh, perhaps uh, you've lost your salvation. So they look at it both ways. We understand that believers can do some of the nastiest things that are imaginable. We think of David, who raped uh, Uriah the Hittite's uh, wife and uh, set him up for murder. Uh, of course, he put him at the front of the line so that he would be, as one of his great generals, wasted uh, in the initial assault. And so uh, basically perpetrated the death of uh, her husband, Uriah the Hittite, a great man. And so we see that David was called <clears throat> uh, the friend of God and the man after God's own heart and all these expressions, he and Abraham. But also we see that these individuals had old sin nature and did all manner of sin. Nevertheless, they recognized their sin and uh, regained the uh, restoration, what we would call a fellowship with God because they confessed their sin. We have entire Psalms, 52, for example, of David's confession of sin when he recognized what he had done. And so we see this, not only 1 John 1, 9, but uh, 1 Corinthians eleven thirty one, a host of other passages that describe believers being restored to a state of fellowship, if you will, with God. And so we see that believers still sin, and therefore the question is, do they lose salvation or do they lose blessing and reward? And we see all through the New Testament, we've noted a host of passages that describe the believer's rewards, that are to accrue for us in this dispensation at the rapture of the church, something called the Bema, the judgment seat of Christ, not to gain salvation, but as a reward for meritorious services above and beyond simply believing in Jesus Christ, demonstrating the salvation that we have. And so rewards then are the issue or loss of rewards, not gain or loss of initial or eternal salvation. All right, so we've been looking at these passages, and I'm going to read these verses, 4 through 6, as we've gone through this section. 
chapter 6, of course, begins with the imperative that we should uh, continue to press on. It's kind of like a first-person uh, plural imperative, let us. He says there, let us press on to maturity. The objective of the Christian life, while it is eternally to glorify God, in this body we are to reach spiritual maturity, at which time, uh, whenever that occurs, we have and give maximum glory to God the Father. So obviously the whole reason we're left in life is so that we can glorify the Father. But the maximum way that we can do that is to reach spiritual maturity. So whether it's the writer of Hebrews <clears throat> or any of the other <coughs> pardon me, apostles, particularly Paul, they all emphasize the importance of reaching spiritual maturity. And the reason that I think the Christian church is in such jeopardy today, and for that matter all the way back to the first century, is that Christians, <clears throat> even when they understand salvation is gained by faith alone in Christ alone, do not many times press on to spiritual maturity, and therefore we have a lot of baby and adolescent Christians out there who know very little about the Word of God and therefore cannot apply the things that they do not know. Not only do you have to know them, but they have to become a part of your very soul and the fabric of your thinking in order to apply them. And so we see then that the error is that people oftentimes, not having a full knowledge of the Word of God, fall away and therefore, <coughs> pardon me, uh, lose the fellowship or the relationship that they have with God in time, not eternally, because that's secured by Christ's death on the cross once and for all. But in time, we can lose that close fellowship, as John speaks about in 1 John uh, chapter 1. And here we have in verse 4, after he talks about reaching maturity and saying we need to advance beyond the basic doctrines, which we looked at in verses 1 and 2, and then says, in fact, we will do this if time permits. When he gets to verse 4, he says, for in the case, and I'll read it in the New American Standard, unfortunately, the Greek is slightly different. Uh, and it's interesting, someone told me last week, the King James has a better rendering here. That's unusual. Usually, the New American Standard has the best literal rendering. But for some reason, the first word in the Greek uh, in verse 4 is the word impossible. And, of course, that doesn't occur if you look down there until verse 6. Uh, they put it there for the, uh, the sense in reading, but I don't know that it makes any better sense than if they just let it at the very beginning of verse 4. But we'll read it as it is in the New American Standard. If you have the King James, you'll, uh, if, you, if you've had the King James, you'll see that, that the word impossible occurs much earlier. And so in verse 4 it says, For in the case of those who have once been enlightened, have tasted, of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. And then verse six, and then have fallen away. It is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again crucified to themselves the son of God and put him to open shame. And there, of course, it looks like a loss of salvation to many. It doesn't say that. It says that they cannot uh, or will not repent for some reason. In fact, it even states here the word impossible, which has a variety of different meanings, and we've tried to explain that. We're going to take another run at it this morning and see how we can do. At any rate, we have in this particular verse five evidences of or uh, characteristics, we might say, of the fact that these people are saved. And so all of these things that are mentioned here that we've already looked at describe the various aspects of salvation. And one of the key and critical ones is uh, the, uh, the uh, let's see, it's number, uh, number three, that they have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit. No unbeliever ever partakes of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit may convict them of sin, righteousness, and judgment, but it does not uh, part, they do not partake of it other than to understand the gospel and therefore to make a decision. The Holy Spirit brings them to the point of making that decision. It does, he does not violate their free will to make a decision. And so we believe in free will and the responsibility of every human being to accept the message that God gives. Because of the depraved condition of mankind, our fallen condition, apart from the Holy Spirit making the gospel understandable, uh, no one would ever be saved. In fact, the disciples asked Jesus that very question, well, then how can anyone be saved? And he said, well, with men it's impossible. 
And therefore, uh, uh, but with God, all things are possible. So he answered really the question here, uh, these things that are impossible, with God, all things are possible. And these are believers. And so in the sense of the individual, obviously the impossible of repentance can be made possible. Uh, but of course, it's very difficult. And the other idea, of course, is the fact that they are out of fellowship, obviously. And that's the reason that they are not making a change of mind at this particular point. Well, we've looked at these things and we got down to the last part. We noticed the grammar in this section is particularly interesting. Uh, in English, we have like main verbs. John goes to the store. Uh, goes would be the main verb. Here we have participles. And so the whole thing is set up uh, as a, 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 almost an aside. So we can kind of see this is almost a parenthetical section here, verses 4 through 6, uh, which deals with these participles indicating aspects of salvation. Obviously, we've noted those that we've become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have been enlightened and tasted and all of these things. So we see all of that and we understand that. And the main verb really is not main, but it's an infinitive that sometimes acts as a main verb. So the grammar is very, very different and actually difficult here compared to most of the other epistles, such as John's epistles and so forth, uh, although Paul's are more difficult as well. But this one is a little bit tough. But we've tried to sort through it, and we came down to the last part here in verse 6. It says uh, that uh, they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. The idea of being put to shame indicates that they are really neglecting or rejecting the cross of Jesus Christ, or they're rejecting it from the standpoint that it is totally sufficient for salvation. When we use the word the cross of Christ, as Paul did, what we mean by that is that Jesus Christ died on the cross and there bore the sins of every member of the human race. And that's the issue in salvation. He died for your sins, therefore do you accept that finished work? Tandem with that, of course, is the fact that Jesus Christ was deity, undiminished deity, and also true humanity. So he has a uh, trifold person. He is the God-man, but then his work was salvation or salvific, and so he was the Savior as well. And so the point of the cross is the whole issue. Now, when we celebrate Resurrection Sunday, that simply indicates that the Father was satisfied with the work of the Son. And so the plan continues, and the verification that that death on the cross was not just the normal death of any person, but was specific in paying for the sins of the world. And the Father was satisfied with that work, demonstrated by the resurrection. And we've noted that uh, in the previous holiday. So the idea of putting... Christ to shame, or the work of the cross to shame, is basically to reject it. We have an interesting word here in the Greek, paradigmatizo, uh, and this long Greek word, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 14 letters. So a lot of times in the Greek, uh, when they have a prefixed preposition like para, alongside of, and digmatizo, uh, which means, of course, to expose. And to expose alongside of is the idea. And it comes to mean to put to shame. So you're taking the cross and setting it aside, as it were, of everything else, rather than being the main focus. And, of course, Paul says uh, that uh, to, for him, obviously, the most important thing is the cross of Christ. And he says uh, that uh, uh, he preaches Christ and him crucified. And that's all he wanted to preach, Christ and him crucified. Well, crucified, obviously, is the cross. And so Christ and him crucified is the issue that Paul presented. So as far as salvation, we need to recognize that Jesus Christ died on the cross. Uh, there are some today in Christendom who are uh, minimizing the work of the cross. I know that sounds impossible. They almost never mention it in their church services uh, without going into detail about who these uh, various uh, churches or even denominations are. But the focus of the cross of Jesus Christ is anathema, sadly, to many churches and pastors today. And of course, this negates the entire uh, reason that we're in, in this life. We are here because we are to be rede redeemed by God and that work through the Holy Spirit. So this particular word uh, in this form only occurs twice. Just to show you the other place that it occurs, uh, look over at Matthew 1. Matthew 1, 19. This will give you some idea here. <clears throat> 
You probably remember this from our Christmas time. So in Matthew 1, 19, it says this, Joseph, her husband, you remember this. This is what happened when Mary, uh, of course, told her husband uh, to be Joseph. She, they weren't married yet. She was betrothed and she was already pregnant. And uh, obviously Joseph and Mary uh, had not come together at all physically. And it says in 19, her husband being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, uh, desired to put her away secretly. Now that disgrace is this word, digmatizo. And that is the, uh, actually, uh, some say, well, this is a variant reading, but even if it's digmatizo, whether it's para or digmatizo, without the para in front of it, it's the same thing, to expose to disgrace, to mock, to expose in some way to the public, to bring her before the public. And if he had, an adulteress in the Old Testament time was stoned to death for adultery. So the fate of Mary would have been stoning, and so he didn't want to bring disgrace upon her to the point of public execution. Obviously, uh, that's the uh, idea here. So when we come to Christ, they're making the fact that he died on the cross of no effect. They're ignoring it or mocking the cross, as those who looked at Christ on the cross were mocking him, as the soldiers mocked him. Uh, they, they blindfolded him and then punched him and said, uh, prophesy, who, who slugged you, who punched you? And then they would laugh. And then they put a robe uh, on him. Uh, uh, you say you're a king. Well, here's your royal robe and the crown of thorns. He needed a crown. And so there was mocking from the time that he was arrested up until the time that he actually dismissed his spirit to go to be with the father. So this word used basically these two times, if you please, once here and then uh, once uh, in Matthew 1.19. The other possible time is in Colossians, where we don't have para, we just have digmatizo, and that is, again, to make public display and expose to mockery. And you can look at that one. That's over in Colossians 2. Colossians 2. This is also important because this particular one describes the victory that Jesus Christ had after resurrection. And after resurrection, in verse 15, uh, we see here that uh, it says, When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. That is, the Father made a public display <clears throat> of the victory over the demons. Now, when did this occur? Uh, this is a past tense that refers to the future. And in the future, of course, at the second advent, Jesus Christ will have a victory celebration. <coughs> <clears throat> pardon me, over the demons and make a public display. In fact, we believe that all the demons, all the fallen angels, including Satan, will be cast off the earth uh, during the millennial kingdom. So during that perfect environment, there'll be no demon activity or satanic activity really till the very end at which time satan is released for a little while but it doesn't say that the fallen angels are released during that time so we see that uh, during the kingdom uh, no uh, uh, and yet fallen angel activity no satanic activity till the very end because they're going to be cast in prison uh, during the millennial kingdom and so that's what he's talking about here and the idea of course says he made a public display that's our word digmatizo which means he's going to mock them and show them for what they are so at the second advent at the judgment we're going to in fact uh, paul tells us that uh, we need to be careful how we judge <clears throat> <clears throat> how we judge within the local church, how we make decisions, because do you not know, he says, that we shall judge angels? And you're going, when is that going to happen? Well, we're judging the fallen angels at the second advent. We're part of that judgment cadre uh, that will occur. We see it in Daniel chapter 7. Uh, when Jesus comes before the Ancient of Days and there's that presentation of the kingdom and just before that uh, there is the judgment uh, in that same chapter in Daniel. We see it also in the book of Revelation. So there is the judgment of the fallen angels uh, before the millennial kingdom. And Satan, of course, is incarcerated, but he will be released uh, during the very end of the millennium for one last hurrah, if you please, uh, to attack and see if he can gather support. And the interesting thing is, <clears throat> and we've studied this, 
at the end of the kingdom, the millennial kingdom, we see that Satan gets a multitude of people who are unhappy with perfect environment. I just, I can't wrap my head around that because everywhere you talk, go today, people talk, if we just could get perfect environment, if we could just make the air better, if we could just, you know, uh, uh, get better cars and better toilets and better light bulbs and that we could clean up the environment. And in the millennial kingdom, it's going to be perfect environment and people won't like it because Jesus Jesus Christ will be reigning as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Well, uh, that's a subject we've covered before, but uh, it is interesting. And so the demons uh, and Satan will be eliminated during the millennial kingdom. Uh, they will not be available because they will be mocked and sentenced to prison uh, for the duration until the judgment at the end of human history, at which time they and Satan will be thrown into the lake of fire that will already be inhabited by the beast, the Antichrist, and the false prophet during the tribulation time. They go there at the second advent. And so some get incarcerated uh, uh, till the end. Satan himself gets released at the very, very end of the millennial kingdom. Well, the point is that the same word of mocking, this is what these believers do. They mock the cross of Christ. This is what we must never do. Uh, and so we see a number of passages that indicate that this is what's going on. Uh, we can look at a couple of them, the idea of the stumbling stone. We see that, for example, in Romans, Romans chapter 9. It's repeated again in 1 Peter 2, 8. But in Romans 9, we see in 9.33, we see the quotation there from the Old Testament. Romans 9 and 33, it says, just as it is written. Well, where is it written? Isaiah 8, 14. It's also repeated in 2 Peter 2, 6 and 7. And we see it in also 1 Peter 2, 8. Here it says, behold, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And he who believes in him, that is Jesus Christ, will not be disappointed. And so the stone of stumbling was for the Hebrew people because they were stumbling over the Messiah when they should have accepted him. You'll remember Jesus came as the Messiah to Israel first, then to the Gentiles, or rather to the mixture of Jew and Gentile, and then to the uttermost parts of the world. But uh, the Jews were to be the disciples of all the nations of the world. And of course, to them, for the most part, they stumbled over the cross. And even to this day, sadly, Christians stumble over the cross. They want a philosophy, a Christian philosophy, a Christian psychology, rather than the gospel of salvation by the death of Christ on the cross and our belief in it. So we see it there. We also see the same thing in Galatians, another place where Paul is talking to the people of the Hebrew faith, particularly, and how they were basically rejecting the cross by saying that they needed to go back to the Mosaic law. They needed to do the Mosaic uh, rituals in order to add to the work of the cross. And by so doing, they were negating the cross. Galatians chapter 5, verse 11. Galatians 5, 11. We studied this. And so here it says, uh, but brethren, I brethren, he's writing to other Jewish people. So we're noting that this was written to uh, the Hebrew believers in the area of Galatia. Obviously, there were Gentile believers as well. But we noted that in that first area, first century, many of the churches were made up primarily of Jewish believers in the Messiah. The Gentiles came in at the house of Cornelius, and today we think of the Gentiles as basically all the Christians, and the Jews as not being Christians. But in the first century, many of the Hebrew people had become believers in Messiah, and that's who Paul was writing to primarily. <laughs> In the book of Galatians, in verse 11, I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision. In other words, circumcision became uh, the watchword of all of the ritual, even though it was only one of 613 laws in the Mosaic Covenant and goes all the way back to Abraham. Nevertheless, that became a symbolic of all the rituals. And he said, therefore, if I still preach circumcision, why am I still persecuted? You know, if I say, well, it's okay to be circumcised, then why would you persecute me? It's because all of the other things as well. He says, then the stumbling block of the cross has been abolished. 
And so the point is that uh, if you go back and get circumcised, let's say, and the Jews, of course, had been, or as a Gentile to go back and try to be a Jew in that sense, or to fulfill any of the Levitical uh, system offerings, then obviously you were, you, you've had a stumbling block, and the stumbling block was the cross, and it had been abolished. You set it aside, it's not important. Or if it's important, it's a side issue and not the main issue. Then we go over to 1 Corinthians where Paul really addresses this in detail. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 17 and 18. In 1, 17, he says, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not in cleverness of speech. Why? So that the cross of Christ should not be made null and void. In other words, he preached the gospel, and the gospel is the cross of Christ. When we use the word the cross of Christ, it's symbolic for the entirety of the person and work of Jesus Christ and bearing the sins of all members of the human race. And so Paul says it there, and he says, uh, for the word of the cross is to those who are perishing foolishness. The unbeliever thinks you're just crazy. You talk about the cross, the cross, the cross, you know. Well, gee, this guy died. So what? Big deal. Well, he rose from the dead. Well, I don't know if I believe that. Well, uh, if he did, and history bears out that he did, the empty tomb, uh, all of the thousands of witnesses, and therefore you need to deal with that. If a man rose from the dead, it might be worth listening to what he had to say. And so he says uh, the Gentiles basically are perishing. It's foolishness. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Salvation and the power power of salvation is the work of the cross, 17 and 18. And then in chapter 2, verse 2 and 3, Paul says, I've determined to do nothing among you except Jesus Christ, and here it is, and him crucified. The idea is that you need to know who he is. Yes, he's the God-man, but the fact that he's the Savior because he died on the cross and bore the sins of the human race, and the Father said, I accept that finished work. That's the reason that we're saved, and it's Christ and him crucified. <clears throat> So we have these various uh, places where Paul also, uh, Romans, 1 Peter, 2 Peter, Galatians, 1 Corinthians, goes through the fact that those who put ritual in place of or alongside of as necessary in addition to or in the absence of the cross, they, of course, fall into this same category. And so basically this whole section then uh, deals with the fact that we have here uh, sin. And the question is, okay, what's their sin? The sin is a national sin. So there's two categories of sin going on. There's the sin of the nation of Israel as a whole, and there's the sin of individual uh, Jewish believers or Hebrew believers. So we have two categories, the national sin and the individual sin. Now, the national sin, of course, was to reject Messiah. And that, if you want to use this word here that we have in our text, the impossibility is the fact that Jesus is going to judge the nation of Israel, and it's impossible for that to be turned back. Uh, not many years hence, in fact, uh, uh, from the uh, uh, from the uh, uh, ascension, we have uh, uh, 40 years from the crucifixion, basically, and 40 years we see, which we take from 30 AD, basically, we believe Christ was uh, crucified and uh, resurrected in 30 AD. Some say 33, but basically 70 AD. And so 30 AD is my contention for his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension within that time frame. And then we have 40 years. 40 years is the last probation for Israel. At the end of that 40 years, God put his wrath upon Israel and Jerusalem, and the temple was destroyed. And so at that time, we have the wrath of God. This is what could not be changed. Therefore, they could not repent as a nation. The whole nation, of course, was under the judgment of 70 AD, and it would be impossible for that nation uh, to turn around that judgment. Now, individual Jewish believers, uh, obviously, or individual unbelieving Jews who believe, they could turn it around. They could repent. They could say, yes, I, I believe in this Messiah, and probably did. Many were delivered, but many were also lost and unsaved at 70 AD during the judgment. So we have two 
concepts. The first one is, as we see here, the impossibility of God turning it around. In other words, uh, as a nation, the nation could no longer repent. They had their opportunity. You'll remember Jesus said, uh, uh, for them, it's going to be in, in parables, but for you, it's to understand. And so they asked him, why are you teaching in parables? Because he gave them the statement of who and what he was and the kingdom, and they refused him. So as a whole, the nation rejected and therefore was under, as uh, Dr. Fruchtenbaum, Dr. Stephen Gare, Hebrew Christian state, this is the sin unto death, or in their case, uh, it was the unpardonable sin. And so the nation is the issue here, not the individual believer or unbeliever. The national sin could not be repented. And you might say, well, how does a nation repent? Well, they couldn't. That was the point. It was impossible for the nation to repent because the judgment was coming in 70 AD. There was nothing the nation as a whole could do. Jerusalem was doomed. Uh, the temple was going to be destroyed. However, within that, there are individual unbelieving Jews who would say, I believe in the Messiah. And therefore, for them, it would be difficult. But obviously, because what's impossible for men is possible for God. So they could repent. They could change their mind and believe. So individual unbelievers could come to faith and believe and therefore repent, even though with great difficulty. If they were, as the Hebrew believers here, simply reverting back, they're already saved, they, of course, could repent, and they would not be uh, destroyed in 70 AD. And there were many who were delivered. In fact, we have a similar situation coming, believe it or not, during the future tribulation. And there's a great parallel there in some senses between 70 AD and the end of the tribulation and the deliverance of Israel then. And so uh, uh, it's kind of interesting. I'll see if I can make a, a presentation of this and make it clear for you. At any rate, uh, we have, for the most part, the nation of Israel rejected Jesus Christ as Messiah. And as a nation, they could not repent as a nation, and they were doomed to judgment in 70 AD. But individual unbelievers or believers could, of course, turn it around. Uh, the writer of Hebrews addresses the fact that they could individually change their mind. And the reason that they were not doing it now is because it was uh, they were powerless not having the filling of the Holy Spirit. But uh, the Holy Spirit, of course, can make the impossible possible or the difficult in, and empower them uh, as they could confess their sins and come back into fellowship. And so when they did that, of course, they could be delivered uh, in 70 AD, obviously. And so uh, this is what we see going on here for these people, that they would be delivered uh, individually, even though the nation would not be delivered and the city of Jerusalem and the temple would not. Now, the interesting thing is when we think about that, uh, and uh, we have, for the most part, the Hebrew people would die. There would be a remnant who would be saved because they believed in the Messiah. Hopefully, they're the uh, addressees of the book of Hebrews and others. So they believed what the writer of Hebrews was saying, and they would not die uh, the sin unto death or be part of this unpardonable sin because they would repent. And uh, with great difficulty, nevertheless, they could. So there'd be some. Now, when we get to the future tribulation, we have exactly the reverse all Paul, Paul tells us in Romans, all will be saved. Here in the 70 AD, none will be saved, basically none. It's impossible to have them repent. And yet some did repent. So obviously some repented, even though it's impossible for the nation to repent, individuals could repent. During the future tribulation, all will be saved. Well, we know that not everybody during the tribulation who is a Hebrew person gets saved. It certainly indicates that many of them are going to die uh, during the tribulation under the attacks of Antichrist. Now, the question is, well, were they saved or were they unsaved Jews? Had they accepted Messiah? Most of them had not until the 144,000 began to minister. And many of them didn't accept Christ until towards the end of the tribulation. And whatever ones were not killed as martyrs, or died to sin unto death in that time, uh, those would be alive, and as believers, they would go into the kingdom. And all Israel that believed would be physically delivered and go into the kingdom. And uh, they would be in human bodies and repopulate uh, the uh, uh, Hebrew population during the kingdom. So they would be physically saved, but in order to be physically delivered, they had to be 
born again, spiritually saved. So when Paul says all will be saved, it's all who believed, obviously, because we know that many Jews would die. And so it's the exact opposite here. No one's going to be repent. Well, the nation as a whole isn't going to repent, but individuals could repent. It's always the case. And so it's overstatement to say that it's impossible in the sense that uh, no Hebrew person or, or believing Jew could be saved simply because he was out of fellowship uh, in the time that uh, the writer of Hebrews is addressing them. Whereas in the tribulation, everybody is going to get saved. Well, not true, because not all will be saved. As a matter of fact, uh, when we studied this, you'll remember that we said uh, over in Zechariah, we might look there. I'm going to go through these just to show you uh, that we have to be careful when we use this inclusion of all. All right, Zechariah 13. Zechariah chapter 13, verses 8 and 9. Here it says, and I, it will come about in all the land, declares the Lord, that two parts in it will be cut off and perish, but a third will left, be left in it. And I will bring the third part through the fire, refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested. Then they will call on my name. This is a picture of the tribulation in the future to our own day. And I will answer them, and I will say, they are my people, and they will say, the Lord is my God. They will have physical deliverance, but it says two-thirds are going to uh, die. So two-thirds of the Hebrew people during the tribulation will die, either as believing martyrs, in which they are said in Revelation to be under the soul, uh, under the uh, uh, altar, those souls under the altar waiting. How long is it going to be? And, of course, uh, they are told not very much longer because they're in the tribulation. So those were the martyred Jewish believers or Gentile believers under the altar. But there are going to be some who are unbelievers who die uh, under the combat of the Antichrist and his armies. And, of course, they are lost. And so the problem is that we see that uh, a third gets delivered. And that third is the third that Paul is talking about. And so we see it there. And we also uh, go over now to Zechariah chapter 9, 16. Zechariah 9, 16. And here in verse 16, it says, And the Lord their God will save them in that day as the flock of his people. And... For they are as the stones of a crown sparkling in his hand, um, and so forth. And so he says here that they will be saved. He said, I'll save them. Well, he's going to lose two-thirds, either through martyrdom or unbelief, but a third will be passed through the fire and tested the fire of the tribulation, and they will be delivered. And so we have it there. Also, we have it in Joel. Joel, we've studied the book of Joel. So Joel, Amos, back up a little bit. Joel chapter 2, verse 32. And it will come about that whoever calls on the name of the Lord, now that's not for salvation, that's for deliverance during the tribulation, will be delivered. Notice the numeric standard even translated delivered, not just saved, because this is talking about the physical deliverance. Now to be physically delivered during the tribulation, they'll also have to be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there'll be those who escape. That is from the battle of Armageddon. And as the Lord has said, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls, the invitation, these are those who believe and they will be delivered. And that's the third that gets saved. And go over now finally to Romans 11. Romans 11, which is the future of Israel where Paul says all will be saved. But we've just seen that he's talking about the third that will be saved. And in Romans chapter 11, verse 26, start back in 25, for I do not want you brethren, that is the Gentile believers, to be uninformed of this mystery, church age doctrine, lest you be wise, arrogant in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And thus all Israel will be saved. This, of course, is a statement that refers back to Isaiah 59, uh, 
20 and 22. All Israel be saved just as is written. The deliverer will come from Zion and he will remove ungodliness from Jacob. And this is the covenant with them when I take away their sins. And so these are the believing Jews, one third of the Jewish population that will remain and be delivered because they're saved, born again, and delivered physically into the millennium. Two thirds are going to die. So we noted that when he says all, it's all that are left. And how do we know the all doesn't mean the totality of every Hebrew person in the tribulation? Because the context tells us that. These are the ones who believe in Christ. And we can go back and pick up the other passages. So you have Zechariah 13, 8 and 9. You have uh, Zechariah 9, 16. And then Joel 2, 32. And finally, Romans eleven twenty six. All of that to show us that we have a national sin of the nation of Israel and we have a personal sin of the individual Jews, either unbelieving or believing Jews. Paul here is writing to believing Jews and the fact that uh, the nation is going to be destroyed and therefore there's nothing they can do about it. It's impossible. However, the individual Jew who is a believer can repent, although it's very difficult because he's out of fellowship, but the Holy Spirit can bring to his remembrance his sins and he can confess them. And so this is then a passage that once again reveals the concept of rewards, and we'll see how that fits as we get into other chapters, for example, uh, in the latter part of Hebrews. So the note I have here is Israel's national sin of unbelief cannot be undone. Israel's national sin of unbelief cannot be undone. This is the unpardonable sin. It cannot be undone. God's judgment of first century Israel is irrevocable, and it would come in 70 AD, guaranteed. All right, I think we've gotten through the verse. I don't know if we'll get through the summary. Uh, we've got just a minute or two, but we might start off. So this is a summary. I have here uh, six points of summary that uh, we want to look at in this connection. So Hebrews chapter 6, 4 through 6, summary, verse uh, 4 through 6, number 1. This passage, 4 through 6, has four interpretations by many scholars. I'll just give you these. We've talked about them, kind of run through them. First, first uh, possible interpretation, A, Christians can lose their salvation. Secondly, some Christians merely have a profession of faith uh, short of salvation. So they, really, they just really professed it, but they didn't believe it. The third one is some Christians uh, lose their salvation and there can be no provision for repentance. They lose it and they can't get back. That is, they lose their salvation and uh, there's no chance for regaining it. Obviously, that's not what's intended in this passage. And fourth, or it's a warning to Christians here, mostly Christian Jews, who move from a position of true faith and abundant life to a position of extreme carnality and apostasy. And they become, as Paul said, I don't want to be disqualified. They become disqualified for further service. It's an issue of service, not eternal security. Say so become disqualified for further service and possibly leading to the sin unto death. If it gets bad enough, God can take them out. There are a number of passages. We'll see them a little later. First John 5, 16. And uh, we have uh, 1 Corinthians 9, 27, where Paul says he doesn't want to be disqualified. And 1 Corinthians 5, 5, where it speaks about the incestuous believer. And Paul says, I've turned him over to the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may live. That is his eternal soul. So point one then are these four interpretations. Four would be the correct one. A warning to believing Jews or Christians who move from a position of true faith and abundant life to a position of extreme carnality and apostasy. They become disqualified for further service and possibly leading to the sin unto death. And this is what we will study in chapter 11 or chapter 12 under Christian discipline after chapter 12, 4 through 11. All right, that's our first point, and uh, we're coming down the home stretch. I'll get the second point, and then we'll have to come back and pick them up in the second service. The writer of Hebrews knows that any believer can fall from his or her own steadfastness and confidence into apostasy. It can happen to all of us. Paul said, I don't want to do it. I hope it doesn't happen to me. So that uh, withdrawal 
from their Christian profession. And that's the idea here. We saw it in chapter 3, 6. Uh, we see it in 10, 23 through 25. We see it in all these different places, including our passage. So we see that it is possible for a believer to fall from his steadfastness, but not to lose salvation. That is the issue that we find here. So we'll come back and continue the summary of these four or uh, three verses, four, five, and six, in the second hour. Hopefully that was, I know it was a little heavy, but uh, trying to present this material and make it clear, uh, perhaps I made it more muddy. I hope not. <laughs> Father, we thank you for the opportunity of studying these rather difficult passages, recognizing the fact that as a nation, Israel had failed to accept their Messiah, and therefore the national destiny was the wrath of God and the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, and for the most part, the vast number of Hebrew people who would die at that time as the Romans came in and took over. Nevertheless, there was a remnant, and that remnant uh, is the, uh, are the people that the writer of Hebrews is addressing so that they might repent, recognizing that repentance is difficult because they're out of fellowship and they've bought into the lie of legalism uh, being set alongside the cross or even negating the cross that they had accepted for salvation. Nevertheless, uh, the Holy Spirit has made the important uh, concept available to them that if they change their mind that it is possible and he calls them to repentance as he does the unbeliever and certainly some of them can and will repent and that's the hope of the writer of Hebrews. Father we thank you for the opportunity of studying this rather difficult section. Pray that the Holy Spirit will make it clear even if I have not uh, so that our souls may understand that we always have the opportunity for believing in Jesus Christ and for that person who is here today without Christ, without hope and without eternal life we want you to know that eternal life is available to you free of charge on the basis of the work that Christ performed on the cross. He died for the sins of every member of the human race, past, present, and future. Yours, mine, everyone's. He did it once and for all. And all you need to do is believe in the finished work of Christ on the cross for eternal salvation, for forgiveness of sin, and therefore a marvelous, abundant life. Won't you do it before you leave this morning? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Father, thank you again for the opportunity of studying these rather difficult passages. Pray that your Holy Spirit will help us to understand the uh, full meaning of these passages and how they pertain to our rewards in the future when we come before you at the judgment seat. We thank you for these things and pray all of this in Christ's matchless name. Amen. <laughs>